Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at the Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Evan Osnos's new book, Wild Land, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after over 94 years, the Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors like Evan and Ian, we wouldn't be here today, and we are truly so appreciative of all of you. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Evan Osnos for the launch of his new book, Wild Land, The Making of America's Fury. Evan is a staff writer at The New Yorker, a CNN contributor, and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Based in Washington, D.C., he writes about politics and foreign affairs. He was a China correspondent at The New Yorker from 2008 to 2013. His first book, Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China, won the 2014 National Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In 2020, he published the international bestseller, Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now, based on interviews with Biden, Barack Obama, and others. Prior to the New Yorker, Osnos worked as the Beijing bureau chief of the Chicago Tribune, where he contributed to a series that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Before his appointment in China, he worked in the Middle East, reporting mostly from Iraq. He and his wife, Sarah Beth Berman, have two children. Joining Evan in conversation tonight is Ian Bremer. Ian Bremer is a political scientist and president and founder of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. You've probably seen him sharing his global political insights on TV or in publications like Time Magazine, where he is the foreign affairs columnist and editor at large. His latest book, the New York Times bestseller, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism, examines the rise of populism across the world. You can catch him every weekend on U.S. public television as host of G Zero World with Ian Bremmer. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Evan and Ian to the stage. Thank you, Sabir. Hey. hey, Ian. Hey. Look at that. Evan. Look at this. We, and we How even, are you? We're wearing matching uniforms here. Kind of. Yeah, it's good to see you. And nice welcome to, to everyone in the audience. Nice to see you. The New York Times bestseller, first anyway. week, number eight. Congratulations! So, Evan, let me. Uh, I mean, people here might not know that. I mean, even though you you weren't the one that invited me to do this, at least I don't think you were. You weren't behind it, were you? I'm always behind it. I'm behind everything, Ian. It's all just no. we have cutouts. We have middlemen. We have people that uh, make it look as if I'm not behind it. But, but I mean, I, did you actually make the suggestion, or did they come up with it randomly? They came up with it randomly. See, that's cool. I kind of thought that, but I mean, they don't, so they didn't realize that we're actually like friendly, like very friendly. I mean, I, yeah. I think, so I think Evan, and I'm, I mean this, uh, when Evan was in Beijing, I considered him, you, to be the most thoughtful Western writer on the ground, bar none. And, um, you know, to go from that uh, to writing a a really serious and and deep and hard hitting book on the United States that feels mm. like it's really two worlds apart. And I'm so I guess I want to kick off by asking you: increasingly, is it less than two worlds apart? Mm. Yeah, thank you for this, by the way, and thank you for this conversation. I mean, you and I like to talk about places uh, and trying to understand how they are in the world, how they function internally, and how we should think of them in comparison and relationship to one another. And to be perfectly honest, I felt as if coming from the life of a foreign correspondent actually turned out to be a great advantage in trying to write about the United States at this point in its history. I Look, I will admit freely, I am a sort of um, not a particularly effective Washington correspondent in the sense that it's not a place that I came up. You know, there are, and you know this, there are sort of different tribes in the writing world. And one of them is the folks who really kind of came up out of the, the, the topsoil of Washington and um, 
think about the particular intricacies of the relationship between parts of Congress and its relationship to other branches of government and so on. And that's not actually how I see the United States, how I see power functioning. I sort of see power as distributed in other ways. And I, you know, I think coming from China, I was inclined, and having been in the Middle East before that, I was inclined to try to understand how, um, how places are perceived from the outside. How do we look to the rest of the world? How does China look to the rest of the world? And if, you'll, if, if you can bear it, I want to give you a very small example, but I, it's one that, helped, that sort of explains the origin of this approach, which is that when I was getting ready to leave, Sarah Beth and I were moving back from Beijing, and we lived in the center of the city, you know, part of Beijing you know well, and we told our neighbors we're going back to the U.S. And my neighbor was a woman named Jin Bao Zhu who had worked in a factory, a glass factory, and had never been out of China, but she watched the evening news every night. And uh, when I said we're moving back to the United States, she said, well, be careful because it's a very rich country, but everybody has a gun. And I, I remember thinking to myself, there was something almost elegant about that summary. And you know, it'd be easy to poke fun at it, except for, of course, what I discovered when I got back here was that we really were not all that much better at describing ourselves from one side of the country to the other. I mean, if you ask somebody in San Francisco- We are number one in handgun ownership per capita though. Uh, well, I was gonna say, she's right actually. On the, I mean, on an empirical basis, not only are we number one, but the closest number two is Yemen. Yemen. We're way ahead of Yemen. So, yeah. you know, yeah, well, they, that's that's mostly because they don't have the cash. I mean, if they did, they'd be beating us. It's not like they country. don't want the weapons, not like they don't need the weapons. <laughs> They're putting them to more effective use, arguably, for uh, for sustenance. But I would argue that in this case, you know, I really did look at it and I thought to myself, she's on to something in sort of describing our in describing us in these kind of simplified terms. And I said, I want to kind of go puncture the way that people in one part of the United States describe people in another part of the United States and go around and sort of um, injure some of these stereotypes if I can. And so, I mean, that's I think this is a fun way to start for I think the two of us because you can't really talk about the United States even in a book about the United States without asking, yeah, um, you know, how do we look from other perspectives? And so, I mean, I, that, that maybe that, that's the way I wanna jump in is yeah. that for someone who has spent a lot of time in the Middle East, in China, who considers himself a patriot, right? Mm -hmm. As do yeah. I care about the country and, and, and believed that our country stood, stands for something greater um, than, you know, just the sum of the parts and right. than many other countries around the world. And yet you and I have both come of age at a time where our trajectory, at least in terms of the legitimacy of our institutions, is going in the wrong direction. You and I yeah. clearly agree on that. This book is about that. Yeah. So before we get into Wildland and the US, um, how, how did it strike you to go from being the American in these other countries, you, China, me, the Soviet Union, where we're talking right. about that we right. have this great system, right. to come back to write one where you're sort of exposing the flaws and how they have come into existence? Well, in fact, those two experiences are fused in the in the origins of this book, I, because it happened to be the period I was abroad. I went overseas right after 9-11, basically with, uh, you know, a few months later, I was I was a newspaper reporter. I was sent out. They said, go get ready for what seems to be a war in Iraq. So I went to Kuwait and started kind of learning my way around how Marines work and things like that. And eventually the war started. And I ended up working in and out of Iraq. For the next couple of years, I would go home to Cairo and come back into Baghdad. And so I was in, in Baghdad for things like the Abu Ghraib scandal. And I remember probably then, honestly, it was probably Abu Ghraib when I started this habit of mind, which it was not, was not I never put it on the page. It was not sort of a, a deliberate thing where I would be making, honestly, a kind of subtle case, a subtle defense for the United States when I talk to people, when I talk to Iraqis. Because here we are in violation of our values in this particularly kind of gr grim and gruesome way. And what I kept finding myself doing was saying to Iraqis, look, we have made terrible mistakes and we will make mistakes and we have throughout our history. And yet, fundamentally, I think we are oriented in ways that should be a source of some inspiration if you're trying to imagine what the United States wants to be in the world. 
Like we really do believe in the rule of law. We really do believe in the idea of verifiable truth. I mean, we, do, we believe in these things. I get it, we're not perfect, but that's the direction we're heading. And we believe that you can make your life a little better. You know, not everybody, but you, you have at least the system to do it. And I made versions of that case to people in Myanmar and China and you know, a half a dozen other countries. And I honestly came back and said to myself, Ian, after about, you know, a year here in Washington, I think I might have been lying to them because I think we have fallen away from our commitment to some of those kind of core, core commitments uh, to such a degree that I'm not sure that I could make that case. And so I, that was sort of the origins of this thing was I went out to say, was I lying to these folks? Uh, was I lying and if to you were myself? Canadian, you know? Evan, if you were Canadian, not American, would you have felt that way? About the United States? No. Would you have felt that way about your country, that you were kind of lying to them? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think we, we made some really specific, um, and, and some of this, we, we, both, we know this, right? I mean, there is this cascade of, it's sort of a political cascade that one could argue, let's just locate it for the moment at 9-11 but you could pick a few points, you know, arguably previously, but that, that proceeded from 9-11 in a way that really did do institutional and reputational damage to our, um, to what we stand for. And, you know, we don't need to rehearse it all because we just went through the 9-11 anniversary. We've all sort of been thinking about that, but does that resonate with you, Ian? I mean, I'm curious if you feel as if there was this period of a falling away from these core commitments? Or am I dressing up the idea that we were ever really devoted to them at all? Sure. Look, my, my first big book was called The J-Curve. Right. And it was about the relationship between a company, country's openness and its stability. And at the time that I wrote it, back in 2012, I basically said there are some countries that are stable because they're open, other countries stable because they're closed. And on the far right of the curve, all of these very open, very stable, very consolidated democracies. It was the United States and Japan and Canada and Germany. And, and now, I mean, the United States isn't Hungary, but it's you can't position the United States at the same place as those other yeah. democracies. I mean, the fact is, and maybe this is the background for, for Wildland. Yeah. The background is number one, that the things that have happened in the U.S. recently, the the events of January sixth, right, um, and the response to it, the enormous politicization of mask wearing and vaccines. I mean, those things literally, I do not believe, could happen yep. in another advanced industrial democracy today. Yeah, and yet they are happening in the United States. Yeah. And that's that is so absolutely the core message of the book. The reason you wrote the book yep. is something that you and I are completely aligned on. So with that, we kind of need to go into, OK, why do you think this is? I mean, we can yeah. do some of the stories, but the people that buy the book are going to read the stories. Yeah. I mean, I think here I want to do more framing and argument and meta. So yeah. um, what and especially because it's what you and I are, talk about and think right. about the most. Right. Which is when, I mean, we call, when do you think, I mean, it's the making of America's fury. Yeah. And you probably play around with that subtitle a lot. You thought about yeah. different subtitles. You never have the one you really love. When, when, when did we become furious? How did it happen? Um, there, I would say at first you have to define, you know, within that it's an encompassing term because there is an element of, um, of manufacture. I mean, and then there's an element of sort of what I would describe as a more righteous anger, a more, a more sort of um, deserving anger, to be honest about it. And I chose deliberately the subtitle, The Making of America's Fury, because I really do believe there was an L, uh, some of this is an, uh, you know, a nod to Teddy White, but obviously this is also about acknowledging the ways in which we created industries of anger and I, you know, I find some of the more satisfying strains of literature that I've been sort of reading and going back to over the last few years in the world of things like the sociology of guns. I mean, we start talking about guns today, and it's actually something that's worth lingering on for a minute because it is so specific to American culture and so specific to how the rest of the world sees us. And I would argue it's it's a it's a much larger 
risk actually for us as an entire nation than we sometimes appreciate. I mean, it is not just about a threat to public safety. It's also a fundamental risk to our to the nature of our political culture, to the idea of reason over force, the idea of persuasion rather than um, compulsion. And I mean, to, be, to put a fine point on it, to answer your question more directly, and because I think it deserves an answer, there is this fascinating tr- pattern that a bit of it I describe in the book that in the same time that, that Barry Goldwater and Richard Nixon were discovering that you could capitalize on a certain kind of white male anxiety in the 60s and 70s, a kind of backlash to the counterculture, you know, the silent majority, that within that, there was actually something happening around, around martial culture, like the actual use of force. I ended up spending a lot of time in the course of, of writing Wildland I went to gun shows. I went to the NRA convention. I lingered in the literature of guns, not because I care about guns at all, but because I wanted to understand what that meant about American culture. And you, there is this, there is this idea what, that was established in the early 70s by a sort of major gun kind of ideolo- ideologist named Jeff Cooper, who wrote about what he called the combat mindset. And the combat mindset is exactly what it sounds like. It's about going through life with the assumption that you are ever at risk and that you must defend your fortress, you must defend your castle, and so on and so on. And I don't need to connect all the dots here. You can see how that contributes over time when combined with things like post 9-11 fear and fear mongering. And when you combine that with the opportunistic language around immigration that was adopted particularly by conservative Republicans in the during the Obama years that and you when you when you sandwich all of that with the with the combat mindset you end up with something kind of like the approximation of a coherent political ideology and I, I mean say, when your principal enemy yeah is within your borders right you're more likely to need a gun right well that that's I think it's partly that they imagine that it's within the borders but One of the moves that happened after 9-11 was that there was this kind of osmosis between the fear of terrorism and eventually the fear and demonization of immigration. And you can chart it. I mean, it's kind of fascinating. It's these like totally forgettable figures like Tom Tancredo, a congressman from Colorado. He was one of the original crazy people of your and my generation. Yes. You know, he was like, he was like the, you know, yeah, he was like the Steve Jobs of malignant anti-immigration. I mean, he was like an innovator. He took the ideas of post 9-11 fear and he, and he actually literally he had said, he introduced a bill called the Jihad Prevention Act, which said that immigrants to the United States have to swear an allegiance never to try to establish Sharia law in this country. I mean, it was like, it was, and, and that kind of idea became uh, became part of the groundwater. And what's fascinating when you look at the origins of Trump was he wasn't the innovator. He wasn't the Steve Jobs. He was actually assembling these pieces that were already available. And he kind of pulled them together, applied his spe- specific kind of marketing power and and skill and, and simply did it better. Now, I, I'm going to stereotype you. I've never asked you this question before, but I assume you do not own a gun. I do not own a gun. Okay. Do, do you? you? I do not. Uh, no interest. I've shot a gun once in my life. Have you? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've shot a couple of times. I've noticed, it just strikes me as the kind of thing. It's like it's like almost like asking somebody, you know, do you own an inner tube? Do you own a water ski? Do you own a unicycle? It's like I think of it as like it should be that. Like it should be no larger than that in our. But it's but it ha- but it's taken on because people have made it that in their own lives, this talismanic thing, which is bananas from my perspective. But So you know. are, are, you, are you in any way starting to feel less identifiably American because you have zero interest in any of that? <laughs> um, I, think, I think the answer is no. The reason why I don't feel less American is because I've, I've seen in recent history, the um, the fierce determination to push back on everything that we've just been talking about. And that's, you know, it's too early for the happy ending of this story, but like that is sort of the encouraging bit of this. And I'd be curious what you make of this. 
like we're not celebrating yet, obviously, in any way. But we have this thing in this country, which is that every four years we have the opportunity for some kind of do over. We have the opportunity for some gesture of self-correction. And in 2020, you had record turnout from people who, and particularly, de particularly you know, cohorts who don't always turn out very, you know, young people and so on, who were saying, no, 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 we will not allow this thing of ours to be essentially just kind of swept away. And the problem, of course, is like none of this is static and it's not the conclusion. It takes work. And we are arguably in more perilous straits today than we were on, you know, I think on January 20th. Um, but what do you make of that? Do you feel like you're more sort of attenuated from the American identity than you would have been uh, a few years ago? A little bit. And I don't like it. A little bit because I feel like I'm a product of the American dream. Right. Parents came here with nothing and grew Where? up in the pro uh, Chelsea, they? Mass. I grew up in the housing projects outside of Boston. And so classic story. And that made me a little bit more doe-eyed, a little bit more rah-rah American exceptionalism. Right. Soviet Union collapses on my watch as a grad student, right? I mean, this is this is formative stuff. Yeah. So very similar to you being in China, right? And feeling about America as you do. And increasingly today, I feel like a lot of the stories about globalization um, and uh, have, have not, I mean, it's very clear that the equality of opportunity that I felt, and perhaps even more so those that came back from World War II suddenly felt, um, with major exceptions. I mean, you know, blacks, Hispanics, well, but nonetheless, um, that 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 just no longer reflects the view of the average American. And I'm I'm deeply empathetic to people that want to lash out against the establishment as a consequence of that. Yeah. But I am not that person. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like here you and I are talking um, at the Strand bookstore virtually in Manhattan, hosted by someone that gave us his pronoun. And that is not an experience that the average furious American in any way relates to. Mm. And I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think it is getting harder to imagine that those different groups will date will become friends, will yep. marry, will bowl together, right? The, the classic, all of that stuff. So I'm getting more concerned. Did you read the um, the article um, uh, by Kagan in the Washington Post just now? Right. Yeah. So that's the other side. Like if you want to take not the positive case, but the negative case, yeah. you would say we are actually heading presently towards constitutional crisis. I mean, look, as, as, as it is not going to surprise you to discover that though I can give you the happy news, I spent 420 pages essentially laying out the right. uh, the, the the diagnosis of an absolutely dire illness. And so Kagan and I are very much in, I would say, you know, we have a very similar view on this, which is that like not only is the system in severe crisis, but I think we're looking at two decades of deepening um, distress. And I think th there's actually, I have this little passage in the book, which is kind of a fascinating, it's, I, through no credit of my own, it was another guy who I talked to. I had this amazing conversation with a guy named Leonard Zeskin, who was a MacArthur genius in the 90s, lives in St. Louis, studies demographics, and particularly the far right. And I called him up after Donald Trump started running. And I said, uh, what's going on? Like, what's with this white nationalist movement that Donald Trump has ignited? He said, well, he said, in 1999, I put into a time capsule a prediction that the awareness of loss of status, particularly by white men over the course of the next 50 years, was going to plunge the United States into two decades of conflict that at times would turn violent. And uh, he said, I think it'll peak around 2048 when you do in fact have this transition from a majority minority country and so on. And he said, I said, so I guess you were right. He said, yeah, but it's happening faster than I thought. And well, so social media moves quickly. And the other, and I would say, so social media is one accelerant. I think that Donald Trump in his person was an accelerant. 
and and the and pandemic. you know, I use ex an accelerant is the right. I mean, the one thing yeah. I and say the pandemic is an accelerant. Clearly, the pandemic was definitely an accelerant, and yeah. and the murder of George Floyd was an accelerant in the sense that it it made things it made things explicit. Like it's time that essentially, you know, look those those protests were the kind of thing that. Um, were very healthy for the United States, it, to state the obvious. I mean, I think that like it had to be, it had to be um, said more explicitly than it had been. I mean, over the you know, we Black Lives Matter had been building; it had not yet broken through to I think a lot of sort of get along to go along liberal white people is the honest answer, and I think it it sort of has. Um, so I mean, look, I mean, I would certainly easy to argue that the election of President Obama was a breakthrough moment, something that needed to happen. You wanted yeah. a black man with extraordinary charisma and intelligence to become the president of the nation. Yeah. I mean, elected with great enthusiasm and all of these people showing up on the mall. And, and yet, you know, you could easily make the argument that actually um, all that did was further reveal the great divide, the structural racism, um, that existed um, in the country and weaponized it to a greater degree. And if you, if he believes, if that fellow believes that 2045, 2048 is the year, because that's the time when the demographics shift, then, I mean, I could easily make the argument that Black Lives Matter is fantastic for getting people that were already oriented, but in a passive way towards recognizing and trying to do something about injustice, but just as easily weaponized and made angrier the people for whom their own willingness to tolerate and even support structural racism was maybe a little more latent and now is becoming a little bit more weaponized. I'm not sure that the Me Too movement has made um, at will, uh, unwillingness to tolerate uh, structural sexism and overt abuse and hostility of women uh, by those that had no intention of doing anything about it in the first place. I could argue it's been worse. Certainly, you see that kind of behavior politically in many circles in the United States. I, mean, I think part of the backlash that we saw to Obama um, was 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 really under described at the time. I mean, when, when I started looking back at it, yes, the Tea Party was essentially a you know, it was a backlash movement against Barack Obama's breakthrough of history. And, you know, it was sort of situated in the language of small government and so on. Um, but that's essentially what it was. And the survey and the social science has kind of gone on to flesh that out. We now, you know, it is highly associated with people who believe that he was born in Kenya and other kind of fantasies. Um, and and so they were shockingly a lot of those people. Terrifyingly, actually. And I think one of the things that I, you know, one of the things that became clear towards the end of the 2020 election cycle was that if you go back and you looked at the number of white supremacist organizations that were growing over the course of the Obama presidency, you know, the people who study this were really saying like, this is a five alarm fire. This is happening way before Donald Trump was in office. And that's one of the things that I sort of wanted to surface was the fact that these things were growing. And, you know, one, one, one thing I will mention on this is there was kind of a fascinating body of work that has been done on political coherence. The Fund for Peace does a measure every year where they say which states are gaining and losing political coherence on the basis of things like the entrenchment of factions, trust in the security forces. Um, and between 2008 and 2018, the United States fell farther than anywhere else. Now we were coming from a high bar, but we fell precipitously more than Bahrain, more than Mali. I mean, it's just this extraordinary liquefaction of the confidence we have in this in the state. And that worries me because, Ian, I put the question to you. You've looked at states that have fallen apart. You've looked at states that have pulled themselves together. Have they? Maybe. I don't know. And the question I people are asking me, I'm getting this a lot these days, and I would put it to you. You'll have a better answer than I've gotten or that I've given. 
is how do you turn it around? How can you turn it around? How do you, how do you, I, mean, sir, that? I agree with you that the, the problem is that you can't just look at countries that have, you know, sort of massive extreme poverty. You have to look at trajectory. I mean, okay. Kahneman tells us that, right? I mean, they've studied this in the lab. Um, and if, you know, you thought you were doing okay and suddenly there's that lo loss of status. Yeah. Or, you know, we can't say mean things about Hispanics and Blacks anymore, but we can make all sorts of racist stereotypes about dumb white hicks that are uneducated from rural areas. I mean, and Obama, of course, with the clinging to their guns and their religion, was doing precisely that. Um, and so you wonder, right? Um, I mean, that's that's a this has been going on for, as you say, a long time. It's been ignored for a long time. In one way, I mean, a lot of people have asked me the 20 year war on terror, did that like take America's eye off the ball in China? I'm like, no, not at all. No, what it did was it took America's eye off the ball of all of this domestic shit that was going on right. that we just didn't think we had to do anything about. Right. And it right. turns out it's really toxic. Yeah. So, but the problem of course, when you say, how do you turn it around? Is that, you know, so many of the places that you write about in the book are, are places that are incredibly divided and life is just fine, thank you very much, mm -hmm. on the right side of those tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, the inequality in the United States, of course, is growing. It's the highest not now anywhere in the G7. Yep. And also a quality of opportunity. Social mobility in the United States is the lowest. That's right. In the OECD, you can predict somebody's wealth on the basis of their parents' wealth. In the US, now when I grew up, that was supposed to be the UK, it was class society. It's true yeah, in the yeah. U.S. now. So, yeah. I mean, you were talking before about guns and you've talked about status. But we haven't talked much about economic inequality. You talk right. also, of course, about the impact of the war in Afghanistan and people come back and look what this did to them. I mean, if part of the problem here is that these issues domestically in the U.S. feel so overdetermined. Mm. The, when we talked about accelerants, like it's not 2048, I wonder what year he thinks it is now when we have like peak violence in the United States. But the yeah. point is there ain't just one accelerant. You and I and anyone on this in this meeting right now would yeah. be able to point to a bunch of accelerants. So I look, I believe three trillion dollars from Biden, you know, one thing we can all agree on is more debt doesn't bother us anymore, mm -hmm. um, will probably over a period of time make a difference that yeah. will be positive but it's yeah. not tomorrow, right? Right, Because this is a generational issue. So I do agree, even if it's an accelerant, I don't know how you suddenly turn it around in less than 20 years. I think, so I, you know, it's funny, it, it's actually, it's kind of fun that we waited on the economics until when we started, because actually it's at the core of the book. Curiously, right. like if I had to boil this thing down to the fortune cookie version, the truth is like radical historic income inequality, Full stop. End of paragraph. I mean, that is like you can't begin to talk about the United States in its current present, its political arrangement without acknowledging that because it runs through absolutely everything. And and I think not only does it affect people at the bottom, but it is having an effect on the culture of people at the top. And that's part of the bit of this that I think needed to be described. That was one of the things I wanted to do on paper here was to capture the way in which it has I think a distorting effect on the winners. I mean, Michael Sandel, who, you know, I'm very sort of lucky to have learned a lot from over the years. You know, he wrote about the tyranny of merit, published it, I think, last year. And he hit on an important idea, which is he says that the problem of the of meritocracy, or we could extend this also to sort of income meritocracy, or, you know, the sort of radical differentiation in benefit is that it punishes the losers and it rewards the winners. It gives, it sort of, it gives, it's a toxic punishment for the losers and a hubristic award for the winners. And that's a problem because it, it that's another accelerant. And, um, you know, and some of the things I describe in the book are cases in which people who are operating in a system in which it is, it's more or less okay to keep contributing to those divides are in ways they don't even fully appreciate by moving a few numbers around on a spreadsheet having a pretty dramatic effect on American political culture. Um, and part of the reason to write it this way is that it, it's, it's been sort of unannounced actually. Like, I don't think we actually talk about that specific piece of it 
in kind of polite company. No, because meritocracy is so ingrained. Exactly. I mean, we, we love the entrepreneur. We love the animal spirits. We think that we can build that. And when Obama said, you didn't build that again, the response to that was this visceral anti-American socialism that right. comes from Kenya. So, right. I mean, I do think that you're kind of, I mean, to, to change that is to change some things that are kind of fundamental to the frontier American spirit. And again, it brings me back to the question of, does it make you a little bit less American? No, because here's what's, I, there's a wonderful observation. You mentioned bowling before. Yeah. Robert Putnam, of course, who gave us bowling alone, mm -hmm. had a book last year called The Upswing, in which he talked about this fascinating thing. He said, you know, we have the frontier, I can, the sort of ideology of the rugged individual. And he said the part of it that we often forget, but is also there as a kind of late motif through American history in American letters and, and the sort of mythology is there's also the wagon train. So you have the heroic Marlboro man on the horse, but then the truth is he'd be dead were it not for some element of mutualism that allows him to survive when he you know falls on a rusty nail and somebody has to stitch him up. And it's these two ideas of the wagon train and the and the and the rugged uh, horsemen that are in kind of some contest with one another and I don't want to pretend that they're equally powerful obviously this one the horse the horse <laughs> the guy on the horse most of the time is the one who defines us but I took that point from Robert Putnam he, he was writing with Shailen uh, Romney Garrett and it was really actually a wonderful book because they went back and they did like textual analysis to show how often the word individual appeared in the corpus over the course of you know books over the last 50 years or 100 years and there's real learning in there because we have this thing in us this sort of recessive gene to want to talk about yeah. mutual aid and you saw bits of it come out during the pandemic and you know i don't want to say the kids are all right but i do believe on some level that there is this backlash to um, to the cruelties, let's call them what they are, the cruelties of politics and economics of so much of the last 20 years. Now, over time, of course, and one of the books that has really had an impact on me is The Great Levelers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, uh, systems uh, tend to, people that have access to power tend to find ways yeah. to perpetuate that power, to strengthen that power. I mean, one of, for me, the last couple of years, one of the biggest things that really drove that home pre-pandemic was yeah. varsity blues. Yes. Because Greenwich, Connecticut, my friend, yeah. right? Yeah. One of your three cities. I mean, 50% of high schoolers taking the SAT in Greenwich yeah. had had their psychologists writing letters allowing them to take it uh, without a time uh, constraint, yeah. which is, pardon my French, fucking insane. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, even me good. looking at that I was like, I want to kill these people. Like, I mean, the pitchforks should come out. This this wasn't the government. This wasn't corporations. These were just your goddamn neighbors from Greenwich. Right. So, I mean, kind of how angry does that make you? Well, you would have a high end bespoke pitchfork, Ian. I just want to make clear that you would always. Oh, have a... I want to be clear. It would definitely be the kind of it would be artisanal. <laughs> artisanal. My pitchfork made by a yeah. single artisan. And at this point, I would have staffers wielding it for me. I think that's right. But you. But know I what? want to say I that think... still be going after the man that which is you know the right what? thing you to do. On something. I mean, look, that feeling that you just described is part of the motivation for this book. I, I was writing partly with a certain sense of despair about this uh, kinds of patterns of abuse in Greenwich because I grew up in Greenwich. It's a place that was incredibly good to me. I mean, being a- And by the way, and you would look good in Greenwich, right? I mean, like, I feel like you could pull, you, you could pull that off. Let me finish, let me finish. Okay. Let me make a rebuttal before you accuse. But here's my point. My point is one of the people in the Varsity Blues case, and I, this is, I write about this in the book. It's, I mean, you hit on the key thing, which is that Varsity Blues was actually growing out of a pattern of other abuses that had been growing for years. I mean, I talk about in the book that there like was- Like your hedge fund guy that you wrote about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there were so many people going to prison from the road I lived on, which is called Round Hill Road, that it was nicknamed Rogues Hill Road. And yep. so, and I was interested in how that was happening. How did people find themselves so deluded that they were wandering in the moral wilderness that often that they were making these kinds of criminal decisions? That fascinated me. I talked to one of the people in the Varsity Blues case who happened to live a few doors away from where I grew up. 
he's a guy who was quoted in the wiretap saying the immortal phrase, the moral element here doesn't bother me. And I said, honestly, I mean, I, the question I put to him very seriously was what possessed you? I mean, seriously, what possessed you to pay $75,000 to change your daughter's ACT result? And he said, I, I honestly, if I had to really pin it down, I would say that um, I thought I was operating in a corrupt system in which everybody was doing what they could. And if I didn't do it, I would be disadvantaged. And that's Putin's perspective. Well, that's the point. Oh, you hit yeah. on it. I mean, that's like that's a whole worldview. And that's yeah. that kind of what is essentially a nihilistic worldview, I think, has taken hold in a larger piece of American, you know, more precincts in America than we like to acknowledge. You know, Putin Putinism. So that's the question. That's what I wonder. How do you turn? Like I, I can see spending money and redistributing and taxing, and I can see support for you know sort of parental leave and you know better childcare and senior care, all that stuff. But what do you do about that attitude of entrenched entitlement, given the system of the U.S.? I think you have to do a few things. One, I think you have to begin to assign a different cultural value to it by having conversations like this and writing books like this, where you say, it's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. Like it's not okay. And that's part of it. I mean, turning that. Two, you also have to change the tax code. Three, I think you have to begin to recognize that uh, that the things that you started off that that comment about, I think are, you know, are, are more than are more than a little bit important. I mean, they are, they are hugely, hugely important. And I think the, you know, I know that the numbers are big, but I think you have to recognize that it's years and years of deferred maintenance in the um, arrangement of America's provision of public goods. And, um, and it has to be fixed because otherwise it really will come apart at the seams. And I, that's, that's, you know, in a sense, that's what I learned from being at, in, in both of these places among the people who have been on the winning side of these chasms and among the people who have been on the losing side. And, um, but I, I mean, I, the reason why I, I mentioned the culture bit is the culture and norms are important. Like if the Ian Bremers of the world, if, you, if we're walking around saying, it's not okay to do X, Y, and Z, you know, it, it, not that we have any influence. My point is actually just that it's like, that's how culture does change. And one of the points I'm making in the book is like, we sometimes will talk about culture in disadvantaged communities and we don't actually talk about culture in advantaged communities. And now that can Which be- Which is boring. the biggest problem, frankly. Totally, totally is, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm someone who's much more intrinsically aligned to punching up than punching down. And generally speaking, if something is wrong in a country, I tend to look for problems among how people with power yeah. ended up ensuring that those that didn't, didn't. And I mean, so Tom Wright, who I like a lot. Yeah. I mean, I get along with him really well, but we really disagree on this because he tends to blame, and J.D. Vance, before he went completely criminally insane as well, tends to blame behavioral issues among the underprivileged. And my view is, well, how did they get that way? Yeah. I, Who's yeah. responsible for that? You know, J.D. Vance is, is reviled in Appalachia because of the way he's written about people and... Um, and some of the best writing in Appalachia has been in explicit rebuttal to his writings. And I encourage people to find it. There's, there's some wonderful stuff uh, that has been done. Sabir is coming in to break it up here. And, did, uh, you, did you think, I mean, before we go to some questions to the audience, I wanted to know, did you consider as a subtitle for Wildland, why Hillbilly Elegy sucks? Did you consider that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, you'll notice it's not in my end notes, put it that way. I didn't, I did notice that. And I was like, and, and nor did you acknowledge him, um, you know, and I think sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know, you want to acknowledge people who have really bad ideas because they well, help I, make I you better. I, you know, I, it's not, it, it was, it's almost, you know, his, that work is like irrelevant and actually people who study Appalachia. I mean, there is some glorious writing that is being done by Appalachian writers that really does help people understand what's happening, particularly going back into the history of things like land ownership and how industries were organized and how power was trafficked through politics and economics. And I found that stuff just enormously. And that's, that's real. If you look at the end notes, that's the literature that, uh, that I'm a student of and I'm grateful for. Well, 
So everybody, the book is Wildland. The author is Evan Osnos. It is number eight on the New York Times bestseller list. Just came out. Everyone has to get a copy. Evan will get you a, a strand. will get you an author signed plate and they will customize it with whatever message you would like. It can yeah. be embarrassing. You should make him do that. That's part of what this, why this works. Uh, so let's bring our host on who's going to now call on a couple of questions before we close this damn thing. Thank you for that introduction. We will not be following through on the personalized messages, just as an <laughs> FYI. But I made that up. I did make that up. <laughs> you're, writing, you're writing checks that we can't literally can't cash. And it's, yeah. Well, so we have quite a few questions across Facebook. And so uh, one of the first ones I think would frame the conversation usefully is from Jared who asked, how would you define American when our political slash social interests are so divided? What generates a commonality? Is it just geography and history? Hmm. Yeah, I love that question. Actually, I mean, I, I really do. Um, part of it, having lived in, in, in other countries, I, you know, I tend to um, ultimately sort of the more I learn, the more I think about the uh, specificity of American assets and liabilities that, you know, geography is to some degree destiny, as Ian Brammer would tell you too. I mean, we really are both um, endowed and then I think also almost infantilized a little bit by being as big and continental as we are. I mean, the, the, the reason why we were so uh, traumatized by 9-11 was partly because it's such an unfamiliar experience to be attacked from abroad. We've attacked one another constantly throughout our history. I mean, that is like a defining fact. Um, but no, for the purposes of this book, I really did think of it in terms of um, America as this collective political commons. And that's the part of it that interested me. A political commons uh, you know, an epistemological commons, the idea that we share in some basic fruits of the enlightenment and we all believe that you can verify facts and stuff like that or so, or so we thought at, at a certain point. Um, so that's how, I would, that's how I would define it. I, I like that question. Awesome. And our next question is from Dan, which goes, if the pandemics taught us anything, it was that our public institutions are fallible and lack government investment. The top 1% saw incredible gains while a large portion of Americans faced financial terror. Their fury seems born of a political impotence that they are told to address by voting, but across different political parties holding the government, or in this case, political office, their, their fundamental day-to-day -day lives have not been impacted how can one effectively expend that anger? And you know, this question will be for both of you. Do you want to go ahead, Ian, and then I'll 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 take up the uh, second. Uh, how can you how can you expend that anger? I mean, where should you? I mean, my 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 view is that anger is um, it's understandable, but ultimately it's not productive. Um, and 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 I I mean I, I think that you need um, to you need to focus on the people that are around you. Um, you you need to connect with your family with your friends um, because asking people to connect with broader society in this environment is is deeply unhelpful. Um, and what I see happening is atomization among basic support networks. You know, I mean, like sometimes we all know the people that are around us that we're connected to where it's not going very well for them. Maybe they've suddenly gotten enthralled with fake news or they had a really rough patch economically or whatever it is. And those are the people that you really need to be engaged with. We have them in our families. We have them among our extended networks. We have them among people we're in touch with every day. But we don't necessarily spend much time talking to. I mean, in Greenwich, for example, in Manhattan, there are people that are serving you. There are people that, and we are, that's what needs to happen. We've, I, I, see, I'm, the thing that I disagree, I don't disagree with Evan, but I, I, at all, I think it's a fantastic book and it's a fan, and he's just such a honest, genuine, thoughtful guy. And that's what I love about him. Um, but uh, you, you, you put the primacy of economic inequality. I might put the primacy of disinformation and sorting through algorithms. 
mm. because I feel that it's the inhumanity. I mean, I remember that book, Traffic. Yeah. And it talked yeah. about how when people are walking, they're pedestrians, they see each other as human beings. But if you're in a car, you suddenly like, you know, you just get angry and what an asshole. But if I'm drive, I'm walking the same person. Well, that's the problem is we have all of this sorting going on. The pandemic's made that much worse. I don't think the pandemic has made it worse principally in terms of economic inequality because we just spent $2 trillion and we helped to alleviate. In fact, general poverty in the U.S. has gone down in the last year and a half because of that. But the atomization, the lack of connection with human beings, we've just spent a year and a half in our own heads. And if you were a little emotionally screwed up and angry before, you're much more so now because people haven't been connecting with you. So that that to me is what yeah. we need to do. I think and... I mean, this is a this is sort of a thrilling vein to mine, actually, because there's a couple things going on. One, I would say that, you know, I think they're related in the sense that, uh, you know, and I, I look at the income inequality over the scope of essentially 40 years is what, you know, the parameters that I think are are important, particularly if you're looking at like the decline of social mobility that you were talking about. That's right. I mean, I think that the sort of the ways in which we have failed to fulfill our own narrative is an underappreciated source of our craziness. Like I think on some deep level, Americans are like, hold on a second. I was supposed to be, I bought this, like, this is what I was supposed to, this was supposed to be my kind of my patrimony as an American is that I could out earn my parents. And of course, what we know now is in 1940, yes, 90% of Americans would out earn their parents today. It's less than half that number. And I think that becomes essentially the animating furious fact. And then, and then you apply the tools of disinformation, the tools of technology on it and it's a wicked combination you know uh, that that's sort of i guess how i situate the two in in relation to one another but in answer to the questioner's question i mean i have an unfancy answer it's a short one which is uh which is vote 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 i mean i you know west virginia is the prime example in 1960 they had 75 percent voter turnout in the presidential election 12 points above the national average i mean just massive voter turnout and in 2012 they had 46% turnout, one of the lowest levels in America. And that's a gesture of a kind of anger. It's a sort of quiet despair, but it's an anger. And but, but we know, we yeah. know that there are efforts that are successful to increasingly disenfranchise people. Yes. Both structurally from voting yeah. and also in terms of making their votes count less. All the U.S. True. is increasingly becoming minoritarian as a consequence. So, I mean, I see the, the voting answer as yet another, for me, something that the man tells you to do when in reality, they've rigged the system. And that's- uh, I would say all, I would agree with everything. I agree with it entirely. I mean, I'd sort of make the case that these kinds of institutional uh, perversions are just profound and debilitating in every way. But I don't think you can then use it as a reason not to vote. I mean, no, I of think, course like, not. You should still vote. I, 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 I just don't think that voting is the everyone should vote. We all know that Australia, right. Brazil, I mean, they have mandatory voting. There's a small fine. If you don't, it works. It would be great in the United it's States. Great. There is no way in God's green earth that we could actually get that done. So, I mean, you've just there is just a lot of structural hair on that. But the reason I'm why I, the reason why I say that is as necessary but not sufficient is that none of the changes that we have to make, like you know, nonpartisan gerrymandering, you know, beating back efforts to uh, to suppress the vote, none of those are possible if you're not actually in power. I mean, this is one of the the conclusions that activists who are in the book sort of say to me, which is we decided in the end, like petitions marching wasn't gonna do it. We have to hold power. We actually have to be in positions of power. We have to run, we have to win, we have to vote, all of those. So that's why I sort of situated in that. I say that voting is a kind of constituent piece of changing those kinds of institutions. But the, see, the problem I think is that when we were kids, we watched Schoolhouse Rock and not only did we sing those songs, but the messages actually resonated with us. Right. And those same messages, which you and I believe no longer resonate. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. So I think this is a good one to end on as it encompasses a lot of your conversation. So this is from Anissa who asks, what are the evolving cultural norms in the United States? What values are taking hold? And is it divided by party? Is it divided by class? But yes, we'll end that one there. Is it divided by party yeah. and is it divided by class? Um, profoundly so. I mean, almost sort of diabolically so. And I think 
um, that's that's one of the things that I'm describing in here is that, and this to Ian's point about how technology plays a role, that technology becomes a kind of an instrument with which you can erect the norms in your culture and refine them even to the point of sort of an illusion of completeness because you can enter into a community of norms on your in your digital life that is fully evolved and it doesn't actually matter that it is utterly disconnected from other parts of the country you know i i, I will sort of end by giving the one of the last words here to uh to Neil Postman, actually, who's one of the people who I rely on a lot in the book, because he's just, he, he's so, uh, for, you know, I think many of the people who, who joined this kind of meeting are, are probably be aware of Postman's contribution, but what he wrote in Amer Amusing Ourselves to Death, which was long before the advent of the internet culture we have today, was just extraordinarily prescient. And what he said in there was that the simulation of community was in the end by that I mean essentially the creation of norms that are un, un, in communities of themselves um, is a world populated by strangers in which we know only the most superficial facts about one another and it was you know that he was kind of a seer in that respect so um, I could make an equal case for the idea that there are sort of um, norms that unify but I don't think they're the dominant sort of dispositive fact right now so I'll, I'll stick with the norms that divide us. Ian a thought before we wrap up? I, I think that's a great uh, word to end on because it brings together both the economic inequality and also the tribalism by algorithm. You and I may see different sides of the same coin but we can't address one without addressing the other. You're here. Thank you for this, Ian. This is so much fun. I enjoyed it. No, I had a great time. It's nice. I'm not, I, I actually, the funny thing is when they invited me, I actually thought we were doing it live at the Strand, which I was much more excited about. Uh, but, you know, I, you and I, again, we, we're, we were together enough that we can make it work uh, virtually. Yeah, we still dress the same way, so it's fine. That's true. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sabir. Kind of like twins, really. I mean, I'm more, I think I'm more Rowayton than Greenwich, but that's, I'm, I'm working on it. I'll get there. Inside baseball. Nobody's going to get what you're saying, but. <laughs> That's okay. I wasn't. That was just for you. I wasn't trying to appeal more broadly. So okay. Well, thank you both so much for such a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation. To our audience, thank you for joining us tonight. And on that note, thank you everyone and have a fantastic evening.